This FedGov Today program is sponsored by the Partnership for Public Service. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, a government shutdown on hold for now, the long-term impact of a shutdown on the federal workforce, and a framework for accountability in artificial intelligence. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. The continuing resolution Congress passed and President Biden signed puts the next shutdown deadline just before Thanksgiving. The current CR runs out November 17th. Margaret Weikert's former Deputy Director for Management at the Office of Management and Budget. Gordon Bitko is Executive Vice President of Policy at the Information Technology Industry Council. He's former Chief Information Officer at the FBI. Friends, welcome. It's great to see both of you. Margaret, I start with you. What should these leaders in government be doing between now and November 17th in case we get to this spot again in the middle of November? Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me, Francis. It's great to be back. Uh, when the players who are thinking about programs that are funded via appropriations, especially if you're thinking about contractors and procurement, it's very important to have a plan for what can we get done now a lot of the players who have gotten to a more agile way of work are better positioned to actually be able to handle this type of shutdown and do more modular type of work. So um, that may not be possible to do um, net new right now, but those players who have programs where they've got money that they can spend and they can accelerate things before um, by leveraging contractors, that's definitely something to do and to think about. The other thing that may be the most important thing is to think about communications. When the shutdowns sneak up on you, um, it's very easy to forget how confusing the whole funding process can be to federal employees and to contractors. So using this time in between to think about communications and really um, kind of fine tune how you're going to communicate with employees both in the run up to and in the unfortunate eventuality that there is a shutdown. Gordon, welcome. It's good to see you again. Uh, regarding acquisitions, uh, Soraya Correa, the former chief procurement officer at DHS was on the podcast last week talking about how to kind of tee things up, especially in the IT realm. From the IT shop's perspective, what should be happening over the next five weeks or so to try to avoid some of the challenges that we've seen in shutdowns in the past? Francis, thanks. It's great to be back with you. I think Margaret just hit on a couple of key points. What I would add to that is it really starts with setting priorities with the acquisition leaders, the technology leaders, understanding what are the things that they have to do. Unfortunately, a lot of the time what agencies do is they say the CR is good for one-eighth of the year, so we're going to spend one-eighth on everything. That's the easy option. That's not really what they should be doing, though. They really should be saying, we have this critical mandate to address a cybersecurity vulnerability or to fund a contract supporting a key mission activity or to delivering some new services to, to Americans that they're expecting. Let's focus on those. Let's make sure that those projects can get going. Let's make sure that they're going successfully and not going along on a shoestring. Margaret, I noted you were nodding your head as Gordon was talking about uh, CR runs an eighth of the year. Don't just spend an eighth of the money. What part of that from a management perspective made sense to you, resonated with you, Margaret? Well, I think one of the challenges in any major initiative is that funding and the actual needs of a project are not lined up. Very often you need to spend a little bit of money up front to do the planning phases and then you have a, a peak where you're spending the bulk of money to actually make change happen. And it can be very disruptive and very costly if you cut in the middle of that kind of peak spend. So really thinking through, you know, to me, modularity and building in agility so that you're not just doing um, a kind of a massive spend that has to all happen at once. If you can stage things, if you can get to those kind of critical milestones um, uh, by leveraging different types of funding mechanism, you know, uh, there's players that have fee income, that have uh, trust fund uh, money that may enable them 
to play out timelines a little bit differently. Those, you know, color of money questions can help build in flexibility um, as you're thinking about uh, your planning for timelines. One of the challenges that these organizations are up against, Gordon, is to, as Margaret mentioned, is to try to get little pieces of work done between now and then. Another challenge that they have is some folks haven't updated plans for a while. I went on the OMB website uh, just this past week in anticipation of the shutdown and some of the plans are as old as 2017. Is this an opportunity, at least for the IT organizations, Gordon, to look at what they're doing and at least communicate within their own teams, uh, here's what we're going to do based on what's going on in 2023? Uh, absolutely, Francis. I, I do think, uh, because I did the same thing that you did, a lot of those plans were coming in at the last minute. There's a lot of September 29th, September 30th dated plans. I think most agencies did do that update. Some of them may be a little bit more perfunctorily than others. But one of the things, again, from the IT and acquisition standpoint that ties into what you're saying is, look at the contracts themselves. Understand, do they have deliverables in this time frame? Do they have cloud services? Do they have other things where you've got the, the expectation to continuously fund, to continuously make investments? Not all these contracts are the same, and it's important for agencies to understand that and for agency leaders. We are in the middle for a lot of agencies of significant transitions from traditional capital investments in technology two fee services, two cloud services. We, we need to think differently about how to fund and prioritize those and to ensure that they're focused on, on the most important things. What wrinkle does that present, uh, Gordon, for the financial management teams that are working with uh, folks like the CIO shops that you used to occupy? It, it does, Francis, require them to think differently very much. The big one-time capital thing, you can plan that out. You can budget for that and you can say, we're gonna use a fixed pot of money at a certain point in time during the budget cycle and you can wait until you're fully appropriated to do that. And, and to be honest, I think CFOs like that in agencies because it gives them a lot of control and flexibility. The paying for things as a service, it's not really an option. The data, they're in the cloud, they're using resources. Americans are using those websites, using those data, occurring those charges. We need to think differently about how do we plan for exactly that reason. Margaret, well, I had a conversation with an agency leader uh, two or three days before the end of the fiscal year. And that person said to me, well, we have enough money that we can stay open until I think it was going to be Thursday or Friday after into the new fiscal year. So this idea of a shutdown on date certain is not exactly what it sounds like folks like me in the media. It's not the way we portray it all the time necessarily, is it? That's right. And I referenced before a term, the color of money. Mm -hmm. Um, there are a number of funding sources available for government agencies that affect what can operate. The key thing that Congress provides is appropriated dollars, and there are very strict legal protocols on how that money can be spent, and that is the money that primarily affects what a government shutdown looks like. Uh, the shutdown that I was involved in, well, there were several, um, but the long one, uh, the 34, um, 35 day shutdown uh, 2018 to, um, uh, at Christmas time, we actually looked very specifically at the laws governing the money for each and every program that we were trying to keep uh, moving on. And quite a lot of um, uh, federal employees can continue to work because they're not funded with appropriated dollars. What did you learn out of that shutdown, Margaret, that you think you'd do differently if you were in that situation again? So I think the communication element is absolutely key and the workforce preparedness element. We've got a lot more flexibility today insofar as the federal workforce can operate remotely. Um, so some of the things that affected workers in the past uh, related to facilities and buildings and um, who was actually able to run and maintain the buildings. Uh, we've got a lot of, um, I think, built-in flexibility from what we learned in the pandemic. Uh, but we need the communication because different people will be affected very differently, even in the same office, if they're funded differently. And being able to explain that to employees, you know, what's going to happen to them, what is the way they can get information. I think using websites 
to share more information for federal workers so they can figure out how does this affect me. Uh, those are all things that I think we would uh, benefit from doing differently than um, perhaps we did in the past. Gordon, final thought and uh, along those same lines, what would be different about a shutdown now than the pre-pandemic when remote work and telework was not as common as it is today? I imagine one of the challenges might be getting your employees to not work when they're not supposed to. I think there are a few unique challenges that the pandemic's really highlighted and the, and the distributed nature of work's a big part of that. Ensuring that employees are complying when in some agencies they allow bring your own devices. Ensuring that contractors are being appropriately overseen when they're working remotely and can work but the person ultimately responsible for receiving that work maybe is, is furloughed. How do you ensure that things like that are being done effectively? I do really quickly, Francis, want to go back to the color of money thing just to make one point and recommendation. It's really an, an incentive here for more and more agencies to be looking at, on the IT side, using working capital funds, using methods like that that allow you to have money to fund projects that's not subjected to the annual appropriation cycle as much as you can, but allows you to invest in, in, in not just core IT functions, but cybersecurity and other things that are allowed under the, the Managing Technology Act. I think that the more agencies do that, the less sensitive they're going to be to this uncertainty that comes up every so often. Margaret Gordon, it's great to see both of you. Thanks very much for joining me. You can read more about the continuing resolution at fedgovtoday.com on today's show page. Up next, the long-term impact of a shutdown on the federal workforce. FedGov Today with Francis Rose. Be right back. Here's Kevin Mulligan from Google Cloud on innovation in government, FedRAMP, presented by Kerasoft. The imperative here is digital modernization as quickly as possible. Uh, Companies are innovating at a rapid pace. They're giving demand signals to the federal government that uh, they have solutions that will help meet their mission. Uh, the challenge is that the, the investment of these small businesses and going through that process is significant. It's time, it's money, it's overhead, it's burning cash as you await you know, final authorization. So anything that can be done to accelerate that process is going to be extremely important. To learn more, go to fedgovtoday.com slash fedramp. Welcome back. Almost a third of the federal workforce can retire from their jobs by the end of 2025, and almost half can leave by the end of 2030. Data show very few people, uh, young people, want to join the government to replace them. Max Steyer's president and CEO of the Partnership for Public Service. He's writing about the future of the federal workforce for Bloomberg. Max, welcome. You and I have talked about some of these issues before. What are some of the biggest holdups that are preventing young people from being attracted to the government and then getting into it? So this sounds a little counterintuitive, but it starts at the beginning in the demand side from the federal agencies. Most federal agencies typically are looking for people who've done the job before rather than people who have high capacity and can learn to do it even better. So we don't see enough demand from agencies themselves for that next generation of their workforce. Then you have the problem of creating an environment that retains the young people that arrive. You have a broken hiring process. And then all the way at the front end, you have the issue of uh, most students don't know about the opportunities that in fact would be very exciting for them. So it's a whole series of issues. It starts with leaders who need to prioritize this as something that is not just about their future, but it's about their present. One of the things, one, one of the elements that you talked about there is m most interesting to me, and that is the idea of, bring, of getting these people um, at the beginnings of their careers. What's the incentive for the agency, potentially, to want to bring those people in rather than people who have quote unquote done the job before? I mean, the incentive is that if you bring someone in who is new to the world and comes as a digital native and with a very different perspective, it's about diversity more broadly. You get people who are going to improve your performance in the here and now. I've seen it over and over again. Uh, it creates a different energy level and uh, it's important. Um, as I said, you, you need that for your your bench, but you also need that input in the here and now. One Chico told me recently, I like the opportunity to shape those people yeah. into what we'll need them to be in five, ten years, and then figure out a way to get them to stay. Does, yeah. does the government enterprise-wide, though, have the capacity to shape people, or, or is it better formed to bring in people who've done it before? Uh, you know, it's certainly not better formed to bring in uh, people who've done it before. That is the cultural norm. I'm only smiling because <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of the notion that you're shaping people for five to 10 years hence. 
we live in a world today where no one knows what five to ten years hence actually looks like. Uh, we need to accept that the people who are coming in new have a lot to add in the here and now. <clears throat> the world will shape them. Uh, the, the future will shape them. I'd be more focused on trying to create an environment that allows them to grow uh, and an environment that accepts that their input really matters. One of the things that you and your colleagues at the partnership do to recognize the kinds of people that we've talked about as a service to America Medals. I've said many times, it's my favorite night of the year yes. in Washington. I yeah. love it, I can't wait for it. What is on tap for the service to America Medals this year, October yeah. 17th, if yeah. I recall correctly. You and me both, it is my favorite night as well, and for good reason, because at the end of the day, what you see is what we get when government is done really right. There's no, this is back to the talent point, there's no better uh, stage to make a difference in this world than serving in the federal government, and these are the people who are doing it. And so it starts with those people. Uh, they often say they feel like Cinderella and the carriage has come, which is kind of shocking given what they've accomplished. And we have amazing stories. There are almost 30 different finalists. Can't tell you who's going to win yet, uh, but I will say that those stories are powerful. They involve everything from our national security to incredible science to helping people in all different corners of our country. So uh, it's the best of the best, um, and we need to be celebrating them more and communicating those stories to the American people so that they understand this is what they're getting and they understand that a government shutdown isn't this abstract com uh, you know, concept. It's actually meaning that you're not getting this kind of work uh, for, uh, for our country. Congratulations to you and your team. on an, It's just an amazing group of people. I've had a chance to talk to some of them this year on the show, on the FedGov Today podcast. They're incredible as always, Max. Thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you. You can find a link to Max's op-ed and profiles of all the Sammy's finalists on today's show page at FedGovToday.com. Up next, a framework for accountability in artificial intelligence. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Don't miss the 7th Annual Appian Government Conference on November 29th in Tysons, Virginia to learn how you can use low-code and AI process automation to empower your workforce, enhance citizen engagement, and reimagine service delivery. Register now at appiangovernment.com. Welcome back. Four components make up an artificial intelligence accountability framework from the Government Accountability Office. Those four components include data, governance, performance, and monitoring. Taka Ariga is Chief Data Scientist and Director of the Innovation Lab at the Government Accountability Office. Taka, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. You write that you identified key accountability practices. How did you identify them and what are some of those key practices for AI? We spoke to two dozen different uh, experts to really come across different practices that are important when it comes to implementations of AI. Our notion is that accountable AI is a laudable goal, but from GAO's perspective, we really want to take the trust but verify approach to mm -hmm. that kind of accountability. What does accountability in artificial intelligence look like, and is, that, is there a definition of it, or is it more art than science that you know it when you see it? Absolutely. There are different ratio of that accountability when it comes to different use cases. But generally speaking, we are looking at the governance structure to say whether the organization itself have the kind of uh, sort of uh, requirements, documentation and standardization process to be able to articulate a sort of AI journey. But also looking at the data and the modeling effort to make sure that those decisions are done in a way that are deliberate, purposeful, and they're able to demonstrate to a third party independently and why those decisions are being arrived. Why is that third party? evaluation, the audit, as a lot of people are calling it now, why is that important regarding AI? Yeah, I think that sort of evidence-based verification is the core of how GEO conducts business. So while trustworthy AI is a, a sort of a nice sounding principle, we want to make sure that when we say AI is not being biased, that there are deliberate practices being applied in a way that allows us to assess and verify, in fact, the underlying data are uh, representative of the constituents. All right, you pose three questions in this framework, and you pose them rhetorically, I think, and I'm going to ask them uh, literally. The first is, how is the federal government using AI systems, for example, what data and code are used to power these technologies? What are you seeing? Is this, you've, this has been around for a while, but I imagine you've seen this progress 
in a number of different ways across the federal government over time. Absolutely. From my view, I see two types of AI implementation. One is more on the mission side. So for example, in the TSA checkpoint, you see facial recognition. There's certainly loan underwriting decisioning type of use case for AI. Uh, but the other side is more on the operation and productivity side. So you know the email spam filter that we rely on day to day, those are mostly AI power. Uh, Microsoft has made it clear that they are intending to deploy a lot of chat GPT type of capability within their productivity suite. And so this is where we're seeing both on the mission side and operation side. Uh, the second one is how should AI systems be evaluated? What approaches should auditors take to develop credible assessments? Do those assessments exist now? Or are we still kind of in a state of figuring out what that looks like given the evolution of artificial intelligence? That's one of the reasons why GAO decided to establish 33 practices across these four principles. We have to have something that's implementable for GAO to be able to evaluate. So looking across governance, data, performance and monitoring, I think those are the sort of cross-cutting principle across all life cycle development of AI. 33 is a very precise number. How did you determine that you had the right core there, that there wasn't something that you had to leave off because the list was too long, or that you, you maybe should have added other things or maybe will over time? That's a great question. This is through a consensus process when we convene the expert panel. We arrive organically at what three, a 33 principle might make sense. And so this is really looking at, even during the deliberation, there were um, interesting topics around, you know, whose responsibility is it to address the equity portion of AI? And so it's very interesting to see how different perspectives manifest. And so the 33 were sort of consensus output out of that process. The third item is what would an evidence-based AI assessment look like? What would an evidence-based AI assessment look like, Taka? We were very much would like this kind of assessment to be routine. Come in and we'd be able to articulate the kind of governance structure that exists, documentations that we can review, models that we can potentially evaluate on a technical level, sample data that we can collect and be able to sort of evaluate for representativeness, and then really looking at whether they're continuing process to monitor the performance of these AI system. Uh, so we're still building that capacity both at the sort of implementation level, but certainly from oversight community perspective, building the kind of technical capability that we need to routinely conduct these type of audits. What does the oversight community need? I imagine that's referring to organizations like yours, inspector general offices across government and so on. What do those organizations need to be able to do these assessments accurately, also efficiently? Absolutely. It starts with understanding of the generally accepted government auditing standards. So the Yellow Book standard is where we begin. But there are technical aspects of AI development. So for example, how are the modeling process work? How do the training data and validation data uh, sort of come about to train those information? How do we deploy these AI systems as though they're software development? So there are multiple tradecraft that has to come together to manage these risks. Um, you have another question in here. Uh, it's not related to those three main topics, but you also ask, what does the future hold for AI oversight? What's your sense of how to answer that question at this point? Yeah, I think it's very important for us to understand and be, get, be able to handle the risk of today's crop of AI system. We're starting to see evolution of AI that are starting to look at data sparsity, looking at potential cognition, even though those are still very much in a research and development area. Um, but in today's sort of deployment of AI system, there's enough risk that we need to sort of get our hands around be able to sort of build the capacity to address tomorrow's risks. Uh, yeah, and that's another question that might be more philosophical than tactical, which is how does one think about where AI could go in the future so that you and your colleagues in the oversight community can be ready to oversee it, given the proliferation of directions that we're already seeing AI go and where th they could potentially splinter off and go. Yeah, two central theme. We want to make sure that implementation of AI are done as a team sport. So it's not just a data science problem or software developers problem. But the second part is how do we make sure that throughout the entire life cycle, humans are always in the loop, making sure that those discretionary decisions are not being replaced arbitrarily. Uh, so part of that is making sure that there's explainability, there's transparency to the process. I mentioned at the beginning there are four elements to this framework, data governance, performance, and monitoring. It, are there common threads among the challenges that agencies have when you go and look at the work that they're doing among any of those four things? Is there one or, or two that maybe stick out as whether well, they struggle with this one or these two more than the others? Yeah, in my view, I think many agencies are struggling with the governance structure. Uh, because, uh, for example, AI-specific exemplar doesn't exist today. So some organization may be borrowing from what IT practices has done in it before and superimpose that on AI development. Um, 
you know, oftentimes that could work to an extent, but not always a perfect substitution. So what we're seeing right now, at least in the early stage of AI deployment evolution, is, is a lot of governance structures are still evolving. Uh, is the governance of AI analogous to governance in other areas of technology or other areas of management or something that agencies can gain those principles from, or is it different because it's such a, a different thing? I think there are definitely overlaps. So for example, there are technical considerations that certainly inf involve cloud infrastructure, for example, cybersecurity. But I think AI is one of those technologies that for the first time there are equity and ethical consideration being baked into it. And so that involves review of legal professionals, civil liberty advocates, and, and most importantly, end user be able to provide inputs into those processes. And so it, you know, for me, AI does um, have a very broad set of horizontal set of risks that applicable to certain IT uh, competency, but not always a perfect match. Does having those ethics and equity principles baked in from the beginning, integrated in the beginning, make the job of putting it all together easier or harder, or is it neutral, is it just a thing? I think it needs to be part of the conversation from day one. It's from design all the way to deployment of AI system, uh, especially on around equity. It's not something that we can fix after the fact because some of these systemic issues are longstanding historical in nature. We want to make sure that those models that are being developed are actually addressing those systemic inequity from the start. Taka, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. You can read more about all the topics Taka discussed at FedGovToday.com. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back. In today's event spotlight, ServiceNow will host modern logistics and maintenance, end-to-end -end automated asset management. I'll be your host for the event Wednesday, October 25th, live at ServiceNow headquarters in Vienna, Virginia. You'll learn how the federal government can manage assets more efficiently. You can learn more about the event and register at fedgovtoday.com events. FedGov Today TV returns next Sunday morning at 1030. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks very much for watching. See you next Sunday. Have a great week. If you want insights from agency and industry leaders on the latest topics in technology, management, workforce, defense, and acquisition, sign up for the FedGov Today podcast with me, Francis Rose. I release new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday so you'll stay up to date on the issues that matter most to federal government leaders. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today.